Well, my clock says that it's noon. Um, welcome to the 2024 K-State Garden Hour webinar series. Um, we're glad that you're here today. I apologize if you hear background noise. The noon whistle's now going off and there's some construction outside my window, so you might hear some noise. Um, this webinar started series um, actually started in 2021 or 2020, excuse me, and has been a collaboration of the entire K-State horticulture team, extension team. Since the start of the program, we've reached over 62,000 gardeners just like yourself. We are pleased to continue offering the K-State Garden Hour series for free. If you have enjoyed these educational web webinars, please consider making a tax deductible donation to support this program. I will link the, those um, links to uh, those sites in the chat here in just a minute. This webinar is hosted by K-State Research and Extension. My name is Andrea Burns and I'm the Ag and Natural Resources Agent in Ford County. For those of you that don't know where that's at, it's Dodd City. Everyone involved in the department or the development of this series is an extension professional at K-State. Most of us have a background in horticulture education or a related discipline, but most of all, we each have a love for educating and sharing important garden topics. Um, I like this series because I learn something new every time I participate or get the op opportunity to participate. So I hope you'll learn something to do. Before we get started, we have a couple of housekeeping things that we need to cover. Um, we don't have audio, so please use the Q&A feature for questions related to the presentation. Um, we'll look for questions at the end of the webinar during the Q&A session. You should see a, bo a button along the bottom um, tab that says Q&A. You should see a button. Uh, you just click on that and you'll be able to enter your question. And we have um, some horticulture agents that are manning the questions. Today's webinar will be recorded and we'll cover and we will post it to our K-State Garden Hour website. We typically upload additional resources um, on each topic. So um, they'll sh sh again, we'll share the links through the chat and we'll link them to the website. And um, that's also where you'll have access to the previous topics and upcoming topics for this exciting 2024 series. Our moderators for today are Dr. Sharon Ashworth and Matthew McKernan. Um, they'll be monitoring the um, chat and sharing information through the chat during the presentation. They're also going to facilitate the Q&A portion of the webinar. Today's topic is companion plants in your garden, and I'm pleased to introduce our speakers, Pam Paulson and Lori Phillips. I'll let them make them, their introductions themselves. Please give us a minute while we transition to the presentation slides. All right, thank you, Andrea. My name is Laura Phillips. I'm the horticulture agent for the Meadowlark District, which covers Jackson, Jefferson, and Emaha County. Um, I'm excited to kick us off today, go over some of the foundations and basics of companion planting, and then I'll hand it off to Pam to go over some of the more detailed parts of um, companion planting mechanisms.
And Pam, if you could move it to the next slide, thanks. So first off, let's talk about what is companion planting. Um, so companion planting doesn't have a solid accepted definition universally. Uh, but I would define it as two or more plant species growing in close proximity for some beneficial purpose. And you'll notice I didn't use the word mutual. A lot of definitions say mutually beneficial, um, but as we'll see with trap crops, it's not always a mutual scenario. So groups of plants that grow well together or that grow and produce some sort of benefit that you're looking for, we call companions. So the first question with companion planting is, does it work? Um, and so when we kind of look at an ecological nature perspective, it's very clear that plants do influence each other and they do influence their ecosystems. So for example, here on the left, we see Appalachian sedge. It's a native sedge to Kansas and it can only grow in the shade. So if it were not for those trees there that are providing a benefit, which is in this case shade, that sedge would not be able to grow. On the, on the right, we see a more extreme example of a plant affecting its ecosystem. We've got um, milk thistle, which has dominated this field. And so you can see that this plant, this milk thistle, is snuffing out other vegetation. It's probably having significant impacts on pollinators, insects, and a wide variety of um, different critters in its ecosystem. So we take this principle that plants can influence each other, and we look at how we can use it to our advantage. So as I mentioned, we can look at different plant com combinations and then we can try to identify mechanisms that will allow those plants to help each other when we place them pragmatically in our garden. So you might be wondering what impact can a plant, a single plant have? What well, can actually change soil pH, can change moisture retention in the soil, nutrient cycling in the soil, nitrogen fixation or nitrogen use. Um, it can change microbial communities within the soil. Um, and the plant itself can also attract or host different insects or pollinators or disease. So when we start to utilize that knowledge and we start to strategically put plants together with that information, that's when companion planting can create benefits, such as improved soil fertility, reduced pest and disease rates, and increased yields. So first, let's talk a little bit about the history, because this companion planting is not a novel idea. The phrase companion planting itself is relatively recent. I believe the first usage of it that we can find was in 1907 in a Country Life magazine. Um, but within the last 150 years, the term came into use. However, we see a lot of companion planting throughout time and across the globe. One you might be familiar with is the Three Sisters. Um, that's an indigenous American agricultural practice using maize, beans, and squash. There's a link to learn more about that in the chat if you're interested. And that does date back over 3,000 years ago. Looking at a different time and place, we also have Greek botanist Theophrastus from about 600 BC um, and Roman naturalists um, Pliny the Elder and Vero both discuss in some of their natural history texts um, how plants can impact each other's success. And Pliny the Elder and Vero actually talked about this within an agricultural context. Another time and place is um, the Tang Dynasty in China from about 600 to 900 AD. Uh, we saw a lot of evidence of companion planting within tea gardens, and a lot of those traditions have continued today. So it's clear that what we're seeing when we talk about companion planting is not novel, but it's something that we have been engaging with as a society for, for a very long time. So that means that some of our companion planting ideas are going to have evolved over time. Um, a lot of gardening strategies or techniques were passed down and utilized by the next generation. So some of our companion planting tips and tricks do have their roots in historical observation. Um, and now in modern day, we're also seeing growing research around companion plants. Some companion plant combinations have been proven by science. Others have been disproven. Um, and it's important to kind of make a distinction that there's proven, disproven, and then also not yet tested. So just because something's not proven doesn't mean it's disproven. Um, and it's also important to remember just because research might show that tomatoes and marigolds don't actually have that much benefit together, we're not saying that there's a harm between those two. So these are all important distinctions to make when you think about companion planting choices and you look at the research behind it. 
So kind of jumping off of there, there are a lot of issues when it comes to the term companion planting. And there's a couple of reasons that I think we see some of this inaccuracy and myth around companion planting. And the first is that companion planting is a broad category. As I said, when I started this off, there's not a single accepted definition universally. Um, so companion planting, as Pam will show, can refer to a lot of different methods with a lot of different plants. And that ambiguity really lends itself well to inaccuracies and myths propagating. Um, another issue is that a lot of times companion planting literature really anthropomorphizes or gives human traits to the plants. So you might see things like tomatoes love marigolds or beans hate peppers. And when we apply that human emotion, rather than saying, oh, this plant will have this benefit for this reason, we can veer away from a scientific reasoning and more into this kind of emotional and um, superficial type of discussion that again can lead to some of these inaccuracies and myths. So it can be very hard sometimes to tell when you're looking at companion panting literature, what is fact, what is fiction, and what is somewhere in between. So that leads me to vetting your sources. As you go off after today's lecture, I want to make sure you guys, when you search for companion plants, understand that not everything that pops up is going to be accurate. When you search companion plants, there is millions of results that will be lists of companion plants saying, this loves this, this hates this. And a lot of that is based off of personal observation or pseudoscience. So when you're looking at companion plants, ask yourself, can this source tell me why the plants benefit each other? Is it telling me what benefit I will see? Is this a benefit that I need? So I encourage you to be skeptical as you look through companion planting sources. Which brings me to my challenge for you today. In just a few moments, Pam's gonna take over and she is going to talk about some of the mechanisms that lead to the benefits we see in companion planting strategies. As she goes through this, ask yourself, what traits allow these plants to benefit each other? What is enabling these mechanisms to happen? And then after today, when you go off and you're looking at your garden and you're thinking, where am I going to put what? What do I want to add in? Use your knowledge of those plants. Use what, what traits you know those plants have. Think about the different mechanisms we talk about and try to strategically make a garden where your plants work together. Even if you can't find an article that specifically says this plant and this plant are perfect. If you know this plant needs shade and this plant's gonna provide shade, you can start to match things and make your own companion plants based on what you need for your garden, for your purposes. And so with that, I'm going to hand it off to Pam and she's going to talk to you more about some of the mechanisms and benefits of specific types of companion planting strategies. Okay, thank you, Laura. Um, so like Laura said, we're going to talk just about some of the different ways you can incorporate companion planting into your own gardens. Um, but also, like she said, you do want to, you know, be a little bit skeptical on, on some of the information you're getting, but also do a little bit of your own experimenting. Not all sites work the same. Um, so what may work for you may not work for somebody else's garden. So there are a couple um, different names that we also see when, when we run across companion planting. One is polyculture. And I really like this because it emphasizes um, a diversity or planting multiple different types of plants in the in your growing area. And so having that diversity really, um, as we'll see in, in future slides here, really creates a good beneficial environment for your plants. It's also um, referred to as intercropping, which is, as it says, the practice of growing multiple crops in the same field to provoke to promote beneficial results. And it's also called interplanting. Okay, there we go. So there are different types of intercropping methods. One is just row intercropping where you have one row of this and another row of that and another row of this. Um, strip intercropping are multiple rows of of one crop and then multiple rows of another crop. So there are a little bit wider areas 
but those different crops are still allowed to interact with each other. Relay intercropping is more of spatial rather or more of a time um, planting rather than um, physical planting. So I do this often with, with my plants when I start my lettuce and such early on. And as those are maturing and it gets warmer, then I'll go in and I'll plant my tomatoes right in with my lettuce. And then as the tomatoes grow, the lettuce gets harvested and then they have more space. So this is more of a, a time method of, of intercropping. And then mixed intercropping, I also do this. I take my my radish seeds and my carrot seeds and my beet seeds and I just mix them all up and I just throw them in one spot. And so then you have, again, diversity, um, but they're not in rows. They're just kind of, if you've ever heard the term chaos gardening, this, this works for that. And here's just some graphics um, showing those. So the row intercropping, it can be one row of this, one row of that, or it can be multiple um, different crops, not just every other one, but they're all in, in single rows. The strip cropping are multiple rows of one crop and then multiple rows of the other. And again, the relay cropping is more of a time um, intercropping. And then the mixed cropping, there, there's no pattern to it. So up here on the top left, we have the relay intercropping. So there's one row of radishes, one row of onions, one row of carrots, one row of cabbage. Um, you can also do you know one row of carrots, one row of onions, and then another row of carrots and inter intermingle it that way. The, um, the strip cropping here are multiple rows of corn. And then I'm not sure what that is in between there, but you can see they're wider rows. Um, but still, the, they're close enough that they can provide benefit to each other. And then on the bottom left here is the relay intercropping. They've got carrots, young newly seeded plant or newly seeded carrots growing in with the more maturing onions. And then the mixed intercropping, again, is just that, that random mix. Um, there's no pattern to it. But I want you to take note of how that looks where it's not just one um, one crop, they're all kind of mixed in there. So it's a little bit hard to distinguish one from the other, because we'll talk about this in a little bit. One of the other ways that we do intercropping is just to provide support and structure. And, and this um, is one of the things with the, the Three Sisters garden is very obvious. It's a great way to maximize space in your garden. So you take advantage of those real vertical growing plants to provide structure to more of the viney plants, um, as well as provide some shade to some of the more tender plants that need some protection. One of the things this will also do besides maximizing your space, it'll reduce disease and insect pests because you're allowing those vines to get up off the ground um, so they're not in contact with soil where they can get some disease or insect issues. But then they also have more um, aeration to reduce disease problems. The other thing we see this with are nurse crops where again, you might have a stronger or more mature crop that kind of protects a younger crop from, from the elements, whether it's wind or sun. Um, some examples of this are again, the corn and squash or sunflowers and mini pumpkins, or even okra and pole beans. So something that's got a good strong vertical structure and then something that's either vining or something that needs protection down low. We also get a lot of soil improvement um, with with companion planting. And one of the, the methods um, that fits really well in companion planting is the use of cover crops. And cover crops are really, um, they're called a crop, but they're, we don't harvest them as a crop. We grow them for their benefits of them just being growing there in that place. So one of the ways they, they benefit our soil is they really decrease the need to disturb that soil with tillage. Often the way these cover crops work is you plant them and then you either terminate them by mowing them or even just plant them in the fall and then they they winter kill and then you can just plant your crops right in that residue. So then you're not disturbing that soil, you're not disturbing all those beneficial microorganisms that are in the soil by by tilling the soil. With cover crops, they're usually either planted 
prior to to your desired crop so that they're in place and then it, like i said you either mow them or um they get killed off one way or another and then you can plant right in that residue or you plant them after you've harvested your crop so then your your soil is not sitting bare so that because they aren't grown at the same time as, as your crop they're still considered a, a companion crop because they are beneficial to that crop that you're growing. So they will reduce soil erosion. Many of them are great habitat for beneficial insects. And this bottom right picture here is crimson clover and, and it's a great pollen and nectar source for many of our, our beneficials. Using cover crops are a great way to move nutrients throughout the soil. So if you're growing a shallow rooted crop like onions, you can plant a deeper rooted crop or cover crop that will pull some of those nutrients that have leached down lower into the soil. It'll pull those up to, to the growing area. Many of the cover crop plants we use are legumes. And so they will actually fix nitrogen and provide nitrogen to the, to the plants growing. It's a great way to improve the biodiversity of the plants that are growing in an area. Again, improve soil fertility, improve soil structure by adding more organic matter and not tilling that soil. And then in different ways, they also suppress weed growth. And we'll, we'll get into a little more detail on that too. <clears throat> so here's some of the, the um, cover crops that are, are great for using um, for your soil improvement. Oats are one that you can plant in the fall and they tend to winter kill and then in the springtime you can just plant right in that residue. Um, buckwheat is one I really like um, for planting in between cool and warm season crops. It's a very fast growing crop. Um, so if I've got a cool season crop that's already been harvested, but it's maybe just a little too cool yet to plant my warm season crops. I can plant some buckwheat in there and usually it'll come up within a, a few days and by a week or two, it's covering the area. And when you're ready to plant your warm season crops, again, you can just mow that down and plant right in that residue. Winter rye is one that you plant in the fall. It, usually will overwinter. So that is one that you want to mow before you plant um, your desired crop. But it is a great weed suppressor. And again, crimson clover is one that adds nitrogen to the soil because it's a legume, but it's also great for attracting pollinators. Winter wheat is another one plant in the fall and then mow it before it goes to seed in the springtime. Cowpeas are one that you can plant early spring um, and then just as they bloom or right before they bloom, again, they're one you want to, to mow because you don't want it to go to seed, but they are great for providing nitrogen in the soil. And they also will, um, they're a very fast growing legume, so they're one that you can plant in between crops as well. If you've got really heavy soil, the tillage radish, which is what's in this picture here, it's also known as a daikon radish, get very long and big and they're great along with turnips and beets for breaking up heavy soil. You can plant those in the fall and then they'll continue to grow until that soil really freezes. And then you can either harvest them and eat them as a crop or just leave them in the soil and they will deteriorate and add organic matter to the soil. Here's just um, a graphic on the nitrogen fixation. Our legumes, um, so the alfalfa, clover, partridge peas, um, the, the cow peas, all provide nitrogen to our plants, to our soil. Our atmosphere is something like 78% nitrogen, but it's in a form that plants can't use. In this, it's one struck by lightning that will convert it into a usable form or the bacteria in the nodules, see these little bumps that are in the roots of, of the legume plants are a bacteria that will take that atmos atmospheric nitrogen and convert it into a form that the plants can actually use. You can also use cover crops for disease management. A great example of that are mustard greens because they actually contain some antifungal compounds. And so, Mustard greens are one that you can plant um, 
almost as a like a living ground cover within tomatoes and such within taller plants and that will help prevent some of the the um, fungal problems in the soil just having some some cover crops in the ground will also provide benefits even if they don't have antifungal compounds having that diversity really increases the diversity of the beneficial microorganisms in the soil and they can often outcompete some of the, the pest microorganisms like some of our fungus issues in the soil. Having a cover on the ground also reduces soil splash. Many of our diseases that are soil borne as rain and irrigation hit that soil, it splashes up onto the plants and that's how those plants get infected with um, some of the soil diseases. So having that cover prevents that splash from coming up onto our desired plants. Again, having the cover crops also just improves soil health, um, soil structure, soil um, fertility, and having good soil results in having good plants. And then just having that diversity again, this is kind of a running theme if, if you're starting to, to catch on that just that, that diversity of plant material um, reduces buildup of insects and diseases in our gardens. Um, and so that's important, even if they don't have those antifungal compounds, having cover crops just helps you increase that diversity in your soil or in your garden. We can also use um, companion planting for some weed management. Some of these plants actually have allelopathic properties, meaning they excrete compounds that will inhibit growth of other plants or inhibit the germination of seeds from other plants. And then we can also use them as living mulches. And so they will crowd out or shade out competing weeds. And um, when you're doing this with living mulches, you wanna sow those seeds of, of those living mulches, either just slightly before um, putting transplants in the ground or just after. And I say transplants because if you're seeding your crop, then they tend to compete um, with other seeded crops. So you wanna do transplants of your vegetables and plant transplants out with your living mulches. Um, if you don't wanna do that, you can just use them in borders and walkways, and then they will either crowd out um, your weedy plants, or again, they'll, they'll inhibit them with, with some of their allelopathic compounds. When you're using living mulches though, one thing you wanna make sure is that you mow them or trim them regularly so they don't start to compete um, or outgrow your desired crops. And so usually if you're wanting to do like a living mulch like um, crimson clover underneath tomatoes, you wanna make sure it's trimmed down so it's not reaching the canopy of that tomato. You wanna to keep it low to the ground. You also wanna keep them from going to seed because then they tend to become the weedy part of your garden if you let them go to seed. So regular mowing and trimming is important when using living mulches. And so just some examples of, of some weed management um, techniques we can use. Winter rye, again, is one that you can sow it as a cover crop in late summer and then mow it down in the spring. Um, the residue has allelopathic properties, and so they will reduce the germination of foxtail, pigweed, crabgrass, ragweed, and purslane. Um, again, you wanna plant the transplants in that residue, and then you get those weed um, inhibiting properties from that residue. Oats, again, are one that you can plant prior to the crop and then mow and leave that residue. This works really great with um, planting sweet potato slips in that residue in the summertime. Cucumbers actually have some allelopathic properties as well. So they make a great ground cover under some taller crops like corn, okra, and tomatoes. They do um, have what's called autotoxic. So they will inhibit other cucumber or other plants in that same family. So watermelons, other varieties of cucumbers. You wanna sure, make sure that they have enough space between planting them um, so that they're not inhibiting each other. And then again, the living mulches, um, we have many perennials that you can plant. Those do best in perennial um, growing areas. So perennials such as thyme, white clover are all 
alfalfa do great in vineyards, orchards, or you can do them around the borders of your gardens or in the pathways. Um, crimson clover is a, again a legume, so it's great for fixing nitrogen. It does suppress weeds. It is one you need to trim um, before it goes to seed, but it is one that, that doesn't always come back real well if it's mowed too heavily. So it's one you can plant in, um, but then if it's something that you want to terminate, crimson clover would be a good one. But again, it's great for attracting beneficial insects. If you do let it bloom, you just want to stop it from going to seed. Cowpeas are another legume. They're very quick growing. They put out thick roots and thick foliage, so they will actually shade out um, weeds and they will inhibit germination of small seeds because they block out the sun um, from those sprouting plants. And then it, again, there's the buckwheat. This one is really quick growing, so it's great for using um, in between cropping seasons. And then we can also use um, companion planting for pest management. So we can lure pests away from our desired crops through trap cropping, and then they will also um, disrupt insect feeding behaviors or egg laying behaviors, as well as just impede the movement of, of pests. It works great to do that, um, doing hedgerows, like between a non-cropped area and a cropped area, if you have a hedgerow or a thick ground cover, will inhibit some of our, our ground um, dwelling insect pests. And again, that, that polyculture just improves the diversity. So you're not having one monoculture where you build up insects and, and diseases in an area. So trap cropping is actually planting um, what's considered a sacrificial companion crop that the pests prefer over your desired crop. And so these are typically planted a few weeks earlier than your desired crop. So that will lure the pests to, to that, that trap crop and then allows your, your desired crop to come up without that pest pressure. So if, they're, if you've got a, a crop that has um, insect pests like cucumber beetles or squash bugs that tend to move quite a bit or move easily, you wanna put that trap crop more on the perimeter of your garden. If it's pests like aphids and thrips and whiteflies that, that don't move very readily, you want to interplant that trap crop with your desired crop. But again, you want to plant them a few weeks earlier than your desired crop. And just depending on how problematic the pest is, is how big your trap crop area would be. But just rule of thumb is about 25% the size of your desired crop. And just a few examples of trap cropping. Um, blue Hubbard squash is one that the squash bugs, squash vine borers, and cucumber beetles prefer over many of our other um, squash varieties. So if you, they do take up a lot of room, but if you've got the room to do it, you can plant Blue Hubbard squash on the perimeter of your garden, and that will attract the squash bugs and the squash vine borers and hopefully keep them off of your, um, your desired squash plants or at least lessen that pest pressure. Cowpeas are one that the green stink bugs love. So if you've got stink bug issues in your tomatoes, you can plant some cowpeas and then collard greens, as well as um, the, the mustard greens are preferred by diamondback moths for egg laying. And so if you plant those, then you can keep some of that off of your, your cabbage plants. Radish, pak choy, Chinese mustard are great for flea beetles. So if you tend to have flea beetle problems in eggplant or peppers, if you plant some of these, um, then you can keep them off of your desired plants. So one of the ways this works, um, often it's, it's said that they will repel pests, some of the companion planting, but actually they're they're masking um, the ways that the insect pests can find, find their desired plants. So insect pests will find their desired hosts by visual cues, whether it's color of a leaf or size of a leaf, texture of a leaf, as well as chemical cues. So our plants put off um, volatile chemicals that the insects can, can sense. 
and usually they will follow that concentration of that chemical cue. So um, the more concentrated it is, the closer they are to the plant. That's usually what attracts them first. And then the visual, visual cues kick in as they get closer. So many of our companion plants um, can limit this host seeking behavior by masking those chemical cues or disguising those vis visual cues. And so by doing that, we limit the feeding and the egg laying of our pest plants. So masking the volatile chemicals, if you plant some of these other plants, um, companion plants that have a stronger um, chemical, chemical volatility or stronger scent, they will mask um, those chemical cues put off by the host plants. And again, remember that picture I told you to take note of at the start here where all of those plants are mixed together. It's hard for those insects to recognize that these are cabbage plants or these are tomato plants when they're planted with a number of other things. So some masking examples. Um, alliums are great for, for attracting aphids away. So if you get aphids in your peppers and such, um, you can plant alliums nearby. So those are anything in the onion family. And that scent of those alliums will, will mask the scent of the pepper plants. And so then the aphids can't find them as easily. Nasturtiums do the same thing for squash bugs. The scent of the, the nasturtiums will, will mask the scent of the squash plants. Really, this only works best in summer squash and not as well in, in our winter squashes. Then again, Chinese cabbage and green onions for flea beetles. Basils, if you tend to have thrip problems and your tomatoes and such, basil is a great one to mask those scents. And then calend calendula is great for um, masking the scents in collards and, and other coal crops for aphids. And then tansy and catmint for planting with um, potato crops to, to mask or disguise the scent from potato beetles. They will also um, look for host plants, not just for, food, for feeding on, but to lay their eggs. And so sage, dill, and chamomile, or hyssop, um, will mask the scent or um, prevent them from laying eggs on, on um, prevent cabbage worms from laying eggs on coal crops. And then tomatoes and basil um, can be planted together to prevent hornworm um, egg laying, or prevent, <laughs> prevent the moths from laying from um, laying eggs for the hornworms, and then tomatoes with thyme and basil for the striped army worms, and then coal crops and thyme for cabbage worms and the cabbage loopers. Then the other thing um, that companion planting does is it creates habitat for beneficial insects. So a lot of our insects, um, predatory insects, our beneficial insects will feed off of pest insects, but they also need nectar and um, pollen to survive as well. The pollen provides them protein and the nectar provides them carbohydrates. And so, yes, they feed on other insects, but they need that that pollen and that nectar as well. And so, again, having that diversity brings in a, a great diversity of, of beneficial insects. This bottom picture here on the left is one of my milkweed plants and Every year they get covered in those orange oleander aphids. But as soon as I see those, I know I'm going to start seeing um, these little white eggs that are on the string. Those are lacewing eggs. And then I will also start to see ladybug eggs and then the larva of both the lacewing and um, the ladybugs. And then the adults do a lot of feeding on those, on those aphids. So, one way to do this are plant um, what we call banker plants to attract the pests. So we're also attracting beneficial insects, but we're also attracting the pest insects. And so the grains, milkweeds, and actually the black pearl ornamental peppers are great um, as banker plants. And the way this works, um, I'm gonna skip this real quicker. But this graphic here, what you're doing is you're planting a plant that's desirable to those pests before you're planting your crop. And so those pests build up on that banker plant, then those beneficial insects come in and start feeding on them. 
And so then when your crop comes up, those beneficial insects are already in place on those banker plants to start taking care of the pests on your desired crop. And then this picture here um, is showing what's called an insectary. And so they've got just all kinds of different blooming plants. Plants that have smaller flowers, but lots of good nectar and pollen are great for attracting um, predatory wasps as well as um, predatory mites and pollinators. And so what they've done here is just bordered this onion field with um, flowers and plants that are great for attracting not just pollinators, but a lot of those predatory insects that will feed off of the, um, the pest insects. And this kind of just wraps up the with the companion planting um, as again, that security through diversity. So having a polyculture, planting lots of varieties of different plants in an area, um, support each other, support the plants, support each other, but then it also helps support that, that diversity in the soil of the microorganisms. It supports the diversity of um, the beneficial insects that will come in as well. So more general mixing of various crops and varieties provide a degree of security to the grower. If pests or adverse conditions reduce or destroy a single crop, other rem others remain to produce some level of a yield. And furthermore, a simple mixing of cultivars has been demonstrated to reduce pest infest infestations. And everybody needs a garden basset. So she she's my little... Um, well, she and her sister helped dig up the potatoes and stuff, but but I just this is just an example of planting a lot of varieties in one spot. One of the other things I've found in my garden that I do is I you know I used to put all my tomatoes in one raised bed, and the spider mites would just move right through them. What I do now is I've got five raised beds, and so one tomato goes in each bed, and then other plants go in with them, and I rarely have spider mite issues now because it's not just one crop in there. So if you take nothing away from this, um, diversity and polyculture are, are what you're shooting for when you're um, growing with companion plants. So I think we're ready for questions. Well, great information, Pam. And there's been quite a few questions today. Um, I think one of the things we'll start with was when you were talking about using green beans as a companion plant, one of the questions that came through was, is it, does it matter if you're using bush beans or pole beans when talking about green beans? Um, the pole beans are what will grow up the, the stalk of the corn or, or the okra, um, but it being a bean plant is a legume, so it will add nitrogen to, to the soil. So. Perfect. Um, there was a lot of interest when you were talking about cover crops, and you gave us a great list of cover crops in your presentation. If you had to choose maybe one or two of the cover crops that you mentioned, are there ones that you find that people have the most success with in Kansas, especially somebody looking to kind of cover their garden? Um, really, if you could do a mix, and that's what a lot of people will do, will mix like rye and um, clover. So... Um, or even sun hemp is a good one. Um, and Laura, jump in if if <laughs> if you if you have anything to add. But if you could only do one, I'd probably pick one of the clovers just because it does add some nitrogen. Um, I was also gonna say that we actually have a really great um handout on cover crops for the vegetable garden that spells out what would be good for cool season vegetables versus warm season vegetable gardens. Um, because there can be some difference in the timing when it comes to planting your cover crops. So we've got one that's kind of specific to Kansas that goes over that, that I'll drop in the chat for you all. So people can check that out in the chat and find even more cover crop resources. That'll be great. Um, when it comes to the topic of tomatoes and companion plantings, are there any specific plants that would pair well with tomatoes? Um. Again, some of those lower growing um, cover crops for for that living mulch, but then um, basil is good for for masking against some of the um, like the hornworm and um, some of those pests or for thrips. Um, 
other things, again, just some of those plants like dill and fennel that have the small flowers are great for attracting pollinators and the predatory insects too. I would also say nasturtiums can be a really great one um, to pair with tomatoes. I've seen a lot of success with that as well. Perfect, great suggestions. Um, one of our other participants here mentioned their concern about um, using trap crops. Does that actually potentially cause greater populations of pests in an area or draw in um, pests from other areas using those desired trap crops? Is there any concern that they need to have there? And I forgot to include this when I was talking about that. One of the things you want to do with trap crops is, again, it attracts those pests early on. And so you want to try and get those pests off there. So some will spray insecticides. Others, you can use just a shop vac and get them off of there. So what it does, I mean, it's doing what it says is it's a trapping those insects to a more desirable desirable area where you can get them out of the area. Um, but hopefully it's also preventing them from go growing, going to your to your crops that you're wanting. The other thing you can do is destroy trap crops um, at a specific point in the growing cycle, depending on what it is that you're growing and what it is that you're trying to trap. Uh, so if you wait until a certain insect has laid all of its eggs and then you go through and you say destroy all of the trap squash that you planted with all the squash bug eggs on it, um, that could be a great way to really knock that population down rather than providing them a habitat to propagate on. You provide the habitat for them for their eggs, draw those eggs away from your crops, and then remove them so that there's no eggs left in your area. Very good. And I know that uh, squash bugs was definitely a concern that was brought up and lots of people struggle with that. Um, we do have some great publications on squash bugs that uh, maybe one of our other hosts here can drop in the chat for people who are looking for squash bug control. Um, when talking about using plants as companion plants, do you have any recommendations on how close or how far apart those plants need to be in order to have the most impact? Um, partly it's going to be what, what plants they are. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, some of the ones like the cowpeas have real thick root systems. So you'll want to give them a little bit of space, um, if you've got larger plants with smaller, you know, living mulches, they can be a little bit closer together, but a little bit's going to be trial and error. You know, you don't want those, those companion plants to end up competing with, with your desired crop. So it's just something you'll have to, like Laura said, um, in her presentation, just kind of trial and error and just be, um, kind of scrutinize what you're, what you're growing. So. And it can also kind of depend on what the purpose of the the companion plant is like if you've got a plant that needs shade and its companion plant is like a shady plant then you'll want them closer together but if you're worried if they're both full sun and you're worried about one shading out the other then you might need more space in between um, so it kind of depends on the traits that your plants have and making sure that all of their requirements will be met will help you decide spacing perfect um, the next question deals with companion plants and, and specifically back to the topic of trap planting. Um, sometimes the trap plants are desirable plants that people want in the landscape, like marigolds, for example. They may want actually the, the beauty of the marigolds or the flowers. Do you have any tips for helping grow those trap plants that we might actually want to consider for desirable purposes? Um, yeah, you know, you can still grow them, but just know, keep in mind that, that they will get their own pests too. I mean, marigolds are great for attracting spider mites. Mm -hmm. um, so it's just, you know, it's one thing you can still do that, you know, grow it as an ornamental or as a desired plant too. just, just know that you're also attracting some, um, some other pests to it. So you may not want to plant you know, plants that, you know, the spider mites like tomatoes, you know, also attract spider mites. You may not want to plant those near each other. Um, you know, plant those marigolds with some other plants that are more resistant to, to the same pests. And so um, another thing, if you're like trying to grow, let's go squash, 
and you have a lot of squash bugs and so you want to plant a trap crop but what you're growing is in itself a trap crop and you want to be able to harvest it you can plant kind of a perimeter of squash and you're like these are the squash that are going to be my trap sacrificial squash i'm trying to keep them away from the squash in my inner square um and so by doing that you can kind of hopefully get most of the insects you're not going to go inwards they're going to kind of stop when they first hit that perimeter nest breed there you can get rid of those trap crops later on and then you still have your harvest which may be a trap crop um, so sometimes you do just plant that same crop twice um, to use as like a sacrificial crop sure and i think the other thing that comes to my mind too is if you know that it's a trap crop and it's a plant that's potentially going to have problems you just want to be out there scouting a little bit more frequently things like spider mites can be washed off with a strong stream of water and so it may just need to be monitored a little bit more closely knowing that it's a, a plant that's going to potentially attract other pests Next question on the list is when we're talking about the attracting pollinators and, and using butterfly gardens, do you have any suggestions on which veggies might be a great addition in maybe a small butterfly garden? Um, onions, the cabbages, yeah, I always don't always harvest all of my radish and they go to sea or go to bloom and those, those attract a lot of um, pollinators. And letting your, your onion plants and your garlic plants flower attract a lot of, of insects as well. And I think a lot of the herbs are great yeah. for larva as well as the flowers. So those could be good choices as well. Yeah, absolutely. How about when we're talking about companion plantings, are there plants or a list of plants somewhere that maybe shouldn't be planted together? So I kind of touched on this a little bit where there are times where people say, oh, this plant and this plant are great companions. An example I gave was tomatoes and marigolds has been touted for a long time as a great companion plant. And the research shows that there's not a significant impact that tomato that marigolds can have on tomatoes um, unless the marigolds are killed in later, in which case they can help reduce nematode populations in the soil. But you're not getting decreased insect presence on your tomatoes. Um, so most of the time it's situations like that where we say these two are gonna go really great together and the science says, eh, there's not really that benefit. Most of the time it's not that these two are going to do bad together, right? It's much more of there's not the benefit that we thought there was. There are times where there's plants say, um, you know, you have something very tall in, and leafy, you're not going to want to put a full sun plant right at the base of it and expect those to be great companion plants because one's going to shade out the other, right? So it's less about what plant's going to hate what, that anthropomorphizing, and more just what are my plants still getting all the requirements that they need? And even if we say that companion plant is kind of a false narrative, we're not saying that they're a bad combination. Perfect. And I think that's a great clarification there. Um, I kind of, again, going back to the topic of spacing plants for companion plant purposes, is it going to be better to follow the spacing recommendations on the packages uh, that maybe, or the labels that come with these plants, or do we want to potentially consider adjusting those recommendations slightly for the benefits we're hoping for? Any guidance there? Mm -hmm. If you're intercropping, I, I would probably, you know, consider that you're planting another plant in with, with your desired crop. So then, yes, you would want to probably space them a little bit further apart. You know, if you're doing um, planting, you know, just an individual rows and then a trap crop or a, a companion planting crop in the next row, then I would follow the recommended, recommended spacing. Perfect. Um, Earlier, you had mentioned some antifungal effects that uh, mustard might have in, in the garden. Are there any other greens that might have a similar benefit or is it gonna be primarily mustard? Um, the mustard is the only one that I ran across, but just having that, um, that diversity of plants in the soil will probably go further than planting plants with antifungal properties. Um, because that diversity really improves the diversity of the soil microorganisms, which 
fight off the the bad microorganisms much better. So um, I'm sure there are, but off the top of my head, I'm not sure. <laughs> And it's also important to note if you're doing your own research on that and you're looking at what crops or plants could be antifungal, that not everything is necessarily antifungal just living in the ground. Some things might be antifungal when they're crushed up and used in a tincture or something like that. So just because something is listed as antifungal doesn't mean it's going to immediately be reducing this is the, the rates of fungus for other crops. And you might want to dig a little deeper or reach out to your local extension agent for more clarification if you come across something that says antifungal and you're like, in what way? Great information there. Um, the next question comes along the lines of maybe one of the myths somebody has heard about uh, companion planting. And that is, is dill a plant that should not be planted near fennel and or carrots? I've heard that there's a potential for cross-pollination there. Do you have any thoughts on those in the same area? They're in the same family, so I, they may cross-pollinate. I've never run into that, but it won't affect the current crop that you're growing. Now, if you were to save the seeds and plant those the next year, that's where those crosses would show up if they did occur. Um, I will say that I have not seen research-based evidence that says not to plant those two together. Um, now you may plant those two together and find neither one worked very well. And then you know you don't wanna plant them together, but I have not seen any peer-reviewed fact-based evidence saying that trials showed a decrease in vigor in either plant when next to each other. Um, but as Pam said, it is good to just have diversity in the families. Um, and so sometimes we say like, you know, don't plant all your nightshades in one spot where if, you know, there's a disease in the nightshade family, it gets everything. It is good to have that, that crop rotation and that diversity in families amongst your garden. Perfect. We'd like to go back to a few more questions on cover crops. That's a popular topic today. Um, do you think cover crops are appropriate or maybe should be considered in small gardens or are they only appropriate in large gardens? Do you have any thoughts on that? I think they're absolutely great for small gardens. I just have raised beds and I put cover crops. If there's not a crop growing, I will put a cover crop. So whether it's, um, you know, in the winter time, I'll do, I'll do some of the rye or the winter peas, um, and like I said, the buckwheat, if there's a period between growing the cool season and the warm season, if there's a few weeks there, I will, I'll plant buckwheat in there too. But um, yeah, it's just much on a smaller scale, but yeah, in the past, we used to recommend leaving your, your ground to go fallow in between crops. And what they found is having something living growing in there is much better for the soil because again, it's giving those microorganisms, um, something to feed off of and it's adding organic matter to your soil. So um, yeah, big or small cover crops are a benefit. Perfect. Um, then when we are done with the cover crop at kind of the end of their life cycle, do you have any advice or information on what we might be able to expect the nitrogen benefits to be to the soil? Maybe how much nitrogen is going to be provided and, and if we would still need to potentially fertilize with additional nitrogen or not? Um, it depends. <laughs> it, it, it'll depend on, um, you know, the cover crop you're growing. Um, so if it's a legume, you know, that will add some nitrogen, but it also depend on the crop that you're growing. So if it's a high nitrogen user, um, you may need to supplement with some nitrogen. I know Laura had looked at how long it takes for those um, legumes to, you know, they'll they'll fix nitrogen, but they take some of that for their own growth first before they give it up to to other plants. So that that'll be a factor too, is just the the age of and the maturity of those legumes that you're growing. So yeah, there's not one one standard answer, but I I you know again watch your plants and see how they're growing as well. So. And I would just echo everything that Pam said and add on a little bit that if you, um, it, it kind of depends on what the carbon to nitrogen ratio of the plant material is when it's decomposing. And so legumes that have like a, a higher nitrogen rate will decompose much faster than some of your grasses. So things will be tied up for a shorter period of time. Um, so it does depend on 
when things died, when it started decomposing, what the weather is like, was it conducive to decomposition very quickly? Did you incorporate it into the soil? Did you not? Um, and then, yeah, as Pam was saying, when I worked at the Land Institute, we did trials on um, intercropping Kernza, which was a wheatgrass, with alfalfa. And we found that it usually took about three years of the alfalfa growing perennially before it fixed enough nitrogen to really substantially reduce the need for um, nitrogen fertilizer for the Kernza. Because for those first, first three-ish years, it was um, trying to establish itself and using nitrogen for itself because it needs nitrogen to grow as well. And then it was taking excess nitrogen and putting it in the soil. Um, so a lot of this is really going to depend on how long a crop gets to grow, how big it is, what kind it is, and then all of your environmental conditions. Um, but generally speaking, cover crops will usually add more nitrogen to your soil, especially the legumes. Um, if you have an issue with excess nitrogen, your grasses, which take up more nitrogen, can help um, prevent nitrogen leaching over the summer, or sorry, over the winter. Um, and when they decompose, they can tie up a bit more nitrogen, but will ultimately give that nitrogen back to the soil once the decomposition process is done. Excellent. Well, I think that's all the time that we have for, for questions today. We appreciate your great presentation and I'll turn it over to Andrea to wrap us up for the day. Thank you, Matthew. Thank you for a wonderful presentation, Pam and Laura. Um, while we typically have more questions than we have time for, that's usually the case, um, we'll make sure to put more links in our, from articles that you might find helpful on these topics on our website. Um, if you need additional information, as we've been saying, contact your local extension office. Once again, thank you for joining K-State Garden Hour series hosted by K-State Research and Extension. We're so glad you're able to be here today and learn more about companion plants. And we're excited to continue offering this webinar series into 2024, but be watching your email for more details on future classes coming up soon. Uh, you can visit the um garden hour website um that's where the video of today's um, presentation will be archived tomorrow and you can also make a tax deductible donation to support the continuation of this webinar um after the webinar ends today you'll receive a prompt to take an evaluation survey Every good extension meeting has evaluation um, please fill it out and we would greatly appreciate your feedback um, if you have other questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to us at gardenhour at ksu.edu. And uh, we hope to uh, see you again soon. Again, thank you. And we hope to continue to you to continue to tune in this first week of first Wednesday, excuse me, of every month. Have a great week. And as spring is approaching, happy gardening. <laughs>